Alright, let's do this. And today's topic is special relativity. So we pretty much wrapped up all we're going to talk about in terms of quantum physics and it's time to move on to the other big sort of shift in the last uh, hundred years or so. And Okay, so um, besides quantum physics that we've been talking about, or we talked about the last lecture or two, there was this other fundamental shift in our understanding of the universe. And as it happens, it was also uh, kind of coming into its own or being formulated um, sort of in the same kind of time period, the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century. So a little over uh, 100 years ago now. And broadly speaking, we call this the theory of relativity. So just wanted to point out that the theory of relativity is not necessarily separate from quantum physics. And in fact, modern quantum physics um, incorporates a good bit of the stuff from relativity to actually enhance our uh, or get better and more accurate results in quantum physics. So, just some pictures here. Uh, you might recognize this cartoon version of a very famous physicist, um, kind of showing this, uh, uh, well, it's tagging light for trying to go past the speed limit. Can't really do that. Um, the other picture here is a picture of uh, visualization of what you might call space-time, and we're going to talk about that a little bit this uh, lecture, but more in the next lecture. Okay, so within the theory of relativity, there's really two main aspects of it, of this theory. One is what we call special relativity, and one way of thinking about special relativity is essentially relativity without gravity, and um, not just without gravity, but without anything accelerating. So gravity tends to apply forces to things, which accelerates things, and yeah. So no gravity, no acceleration, that's special relativity. Then general relativity is essentially with gravity and with things accelerating. So yeah. This lecture is going to be all about special relativity, and next time we'll talk about general relativity. And just a little bit of a preview of what's to come, there's two different sort of images here. The first is showing some clocks that are, um, well, one would be maybe a clock in a satellite in orbit, and one's a clock on Earth, and it shows that they're not showing, indicating the same time, the same amount of time elapsed. This other one is showing two different pictures of the same meter stick, one where the meter stick is at rest, and the other when the meter stick is moving very, very fast at a constant rate um, that's actually close to the speed of light. Okay, so one of the main sort of uh, aspects or underlying ideas in relativity in general is that all motion is relative. So this is a bit of a shift from earlier, uh, maybe more classical ideas of physics and the universe where uh, in Newton's time, and Newton himself basically understood or thought the universe had sort of this static background, uh, like a canvas, and that was space. And so space was this thing, and so you could move, if you were moving relative to space, then you had some inherent motion. You're, there was motion because you're moving relative to this background of space that's just static, it's there. Um, a part of what made 
came or what brought relativity about was understanding that that's not really true. Space is not this static background thing, and in fact, space can be mutable, it can change. Um, and one of the things, one of the ideas behind that is that all the motion is in fact relative. So there's no sense that I'm moving, like if I were to start walking to the side, the only sense that I'm moving is relative to other things. So relative to the earth, relative to that stationary camera that's filling me or relative to even uh, the sun, or to distant stars. So one example that tends to jump out at me once in a while, um, that kind of elicits this or indicates this, is sometimes when you're sitting in a parked car, you're in a um, you know you're in a parking spot, and every once in a while, uh, the car maybe to the left or to the right of you starts to back out, and your brain at some point, sometimes at least mine does this sometimes, it tells me that no, that car's not moving, it's actually me that's rolling forward and I start to freak out for a second I'm gonna roll into the car in front of me and be in trouble. All right. So it turns out the sort of the reason behind that mistake that happens or that, uh, that confusion that can happen is that the motion is actually ambiguous. Which object is moving is in fact ambiguous because that motion is relative. Whether the car is backing up, whether I'm rolling forward, is only um, understood from, say, a whole nother perspective, being like the surface of the Earth, right? So if I'm in the car that's, you know, that's parked, or I'm in the car that's uh, backing up, those things only make sense from the other perspective of the Earth that's still with, in terms of both of those things. Well, it's still it's in its other own sort of uh, frame. But if I'm in the car, it might as well be me that's rolling forward and not the other car that's rolling back. So essentially, if you can imagine situations where uh, something is moving relative to you, but there's nothing else around, then there's no way to actually say whether or not it's you that's moving or the other thing that's moving. So this all gets to the idea of a frame of reference meaning a sort of place where you observe motion from. And beyond that, that place that is at rest by itself. So it can be an abstract sort of idea, but in general, or the easiest thing to think about is just yourself, right? Whenever I look at something, whenever I observe something moving or something happening, I myself am always at rest in that reference frame. Right? There's no there's no way for me to be moving in my own reference frame because I'm Steve, like I I am the reference frame. Right? I can't move from my reference frame because that's what it that's where it is. It's me. So a reference frame you just kind of imagine either like as yourself sitting and observing something, maybe uh, you're stationary, maybe you're moving, um, or you can imagine it just as like you know like a camera. Uh, in some position, or again, camera just moving, watching something. Um, yeah, so the most kind of common reference frame that we use is the reference frame of the Earth, or the Earth's surface. So, in general, when you're talking about motion, or like, you know, most often, if you're talking about the motion of something, you're talking about it relative to the Earth's surface. All right, so when I say, there's a car, and it's moving at 60 miles an hour, maybe north at 60 miles an hour, what you're really saying in full would be it's moving at 60 miles an hour relative to the surface of the Earth. And that becomes more clear if you think about another reference frame that's not the surface of the Earth. Right? From the sun's reference frame, if you, were, if you could imagine yourself where the sun is, watching the Earth and watching the car on the Earth, the, what you would see is actually the car moving much, much faster than that the car is moving essentially the way that the Earth is moving. The Earth is revolving around the Sun, and it's revolving around the Sun at something like 67,000 miles per hour. Incredibly fast. So from the reference frame of the Sun, the car is actually moving not 16 miles an hour north, it's moving 67 miles an hour, maybe uh, however you want to indicate the clockwise or counterclockwise sort of direction. So, very important sort of idea is this frames of reference. 
so important that we're going to talk about it a little bit more. Um, and I should also say that it, whether you, whether I say frame of reference or reference frame, those would mean the same thing. Oh, it's just sometimes one term is easier to use than the other. It makes more sense to use than the other, but they mean the exact same thing. So if I say frame of reference or if I say reference frame or even just frame every once in a while, all mean the same thing, right? It's a place where you observe something from and that place itself is at rest. It's not moving in its own reference frame. Okay, so in terms of, well, not just relativity, but in general, there are two main kinds of reference frames. Right? See, I did already right there, reference frames. There's two main kinds, and I sometimes use this abbreviation because frame of reference is a long thing, so that F-O-R is just frame of reference. So an inertial reference frame is going to be one that is itself at rest or moving at a constant speed. Right? So if, say, you imagine yourself um, in your own reference frame, you're always at rest. But if you can, you can then imagine other reference frames, like, say, um, a person who's standing across from you and who's talking to you. Right? In their reference frame, they're at rest. As long as neither of you uh, start walking away from each other, then uh, their reference frame is also at rest in terms of you. So they're also an inertial reference frame. If that person, say, was walking by you at a constant speed, maybe like four miles an hour, then that's still an inertial reference frame. It's a frame of reference that is moving at a constant rate. Yeah, moving at a constant rate. A uniform speed, right? So, in special relativity, it all deals with uh, these uniform speeds or uh, things that are at rest, right? So that's why in this lecture we're talking all about inertial reference frames and comparing inertial reference frames. Whereas next lecture we're going to do the other one, which is non-inertial reference frames or non-inertial frames of reference. So just as well. An inertial one is where you're either at rest or at a constant speed, moving at a constant speed. Non-inertial is not at rest, not at a constant speed, so you're speeding up or you're slowing down, i.e. you're accelerating. Okay. So any reference frame that's accelerating is not an inertial reference frame. So if I'm sitting here uh, watching a car take off from a stoplight, right? they're pushing on the gas, they're accelerating from zero miles per hour up to say 30 miles an hour or something like that, that's not an inertial reference frame. It's a non-inertial reference frame right? because they're accelerating. And yeah, so I'm kind of putting a lot of, or a decent amount of time into explaining these frames of reference because a lot of what we're going to have to try to understand in this lecture has to do with imagining yourself observing things in different uh, frames of reference. So imagine yourself being the one standing here or being the one in the car that's moving along. Right? Or more, even more extreme, the maybe imagining when you can stand on the Earth's surface, um, if you look up at the right time and you know where to look, you can actually see the International Space Station moving across the sky. And it might not look like it's moving that fast. It kind of just moves along, right? But it's going through a whole you know, arc of the sky there. So it's actually moving quite fast. It's moving something like four miles a second. Right? So in one second, it's going to have gone four miles long. Right? So if you're in the frame of reference of the Earth, that is another frame of reference that you can look at. And from your perspective, that frame of reference is moving at four miles a second. Okay. However, if you were in the ISS, the International Space Station, and you're looking down at Earth's surface, right? Again, that's now your reference frame, so you can't be moving in your own reference frame. So this person here in the space station is actually at rest, and it's the Earth's surface that appears to move at four miles per second. In the opposite direction, right? 
And, and just to be clear, as long as that four miles a second is constant, um, this is essentially almost uh, inertial reference frames. It turns out it's not exactly inertial because both of these frames of reference are actually rotating, which means they're accelerating, but that amount of it is very small compared, well, it's very small, pretty small overall, so these, both of these frames of reference are essentially um, inertial, meaning from my reference frame on Earth, I'm essentially standing still and watching this other frame of reference in the space station, they're just moving along at this constant four miles a second. And then from the frame of reference of the person in the space station, this astronaut, it's actually the Earth's surface, or me, the person on the Earth's surface, their arrest, me, the person on the Earth's surface, is just moving by at this four miles a second. Okay, so now's a good time maybe to think about these inertial frames of reference. And yeah, so which one of these do you think is an inertial frame of reference? Well, it turns out none of those are actually inertial frames of reference. And as I kind of got pulled, or kind of pulled myself into explaining the last slide, um, it turns out there are not many things that are actually totally inertial frame, it, or inertial, right? meaning just moving at constant speed. Most things are either speeding up or slowing down, at least a little bit, right? Um, in the case of the child on the merry-go-round, right, they might be going at a constant rate uh, around in a, in a circle, but it, we have to remember that the fact that they're moving around a circle means that they're actually um, accelerating towards the center of the circle, right? Their speed might, might not be changing, but the direction that their speed is uh, going is actually constantly changing, right? So the fact that their speed is changing means they are accelerating, and it's not an inertial reference rate. So it turns out that the only thing that's really close to being an inertial reference frame here might be the bullet fired out of a gun. So it's not exactly inertial, but it's fairly close because when it's fired out of the gun, it's essentially just moving at this constant rate, like right across, um, or at least for momentarily, it's kind of going at this constant rate. It's technically being decelerated by so maybe some wind resistance, so it slows down more uh, a little bit as it moves along. It's also technically being accelerated by gravity just like the apple was, but if you think about the bullet moving right after it moves out of the barrel of the gun, it's essentially just kind of going boom, zip straight across, no real acceleration going on there, or not much of an acceleration going on there. So that's why of these options, if you said the bullet fired out of the gun, good for you, that was pretty close, right? That's a fairly good response, right? But technically it's not. All right, so we've learned a little bit about reference frames and inertial reference frames, right? So we could seek the first principle of special relativity. So the special relativity and relativity in general is a little bit, maybe a little bit odd in that it essentially partly came about, or came about mostly because uh, people like uh, Einstein mostly had these principles and these sort of like axioms to say this is how, or from all that we've seen, this is probably a principle of nature, right? That this is true. And from those principles, it turns out you can generate uh, mathematical equations and use those equations to predict things and then test and see if those predictions are actually true. So for special relativity, one of those principles is that the laws of physics should be identical in all inertial reference frames. So essentially, you know, whether you're standing on the uh, platform next to a train, so essentially you're kind of at rest, whether you're on the train and you're 
flying down the tracks or moving slowly or whatever, regardless, you're um, moving at a constant speed, maybe not a very fast speed, but a constant speed, so you're still an inertial reference frame. Or you're on some kind of crazy sci-fi space bullet train and you're zipping along at close to the speed of light, but as long as it's at a constant speed, it's still an inertial reference frame. So all of these, you do something in all of these uh, reference frames, and all, imagine yourself doing stuff in all these reference frames, and the laws of physics all are identical. The way things act is identical. So thinking about, you know, like if you uh, take a ball and you toss it up in the air, it's going to drop, it's going to go up, it's going to go straight back down. Right? So this is an example of, well, sort of, of uh, something where in all of these reference frames, regardless of how fast something is going, as long as it's going at a constant rate, you're going to see the same result. Right? So you toss the ball up in the air, in all of these situations, the ball's going to come up, and it's going to go up, and it's going to come back in. Okay, so now we're getting, we'll get to some maybe more interesting uh, aspects of special relativity, and a lot of them have to do with thinking about light and observing light. So I wasn't lying in one of those last lectures when I told you there's a whole lot of stuff going on with light, and yeah, there, so there's even more. So, for a long time, or for at least a period in history, it was sort of thought that, well, if there, this isn't exactly how the story kind of goes, but it's maybe a, a decentish way to explain and understand it. So, if you think to yourself that all motion is relative, um, then it would make sense that light would appear to move at different speeds depending on your frame of reference. Right? So, imagine like turning on a, a flashlight or a laser and you see the light if you could see the light. It moves very fast, but maybe say that you could see in a very, very high frame rate, very, very, very quickly. So you can actually watch the light propagate out. Right? So you can kind of see the light at, uh, moving at light speed. So if the motion of everything is relative, including light, then you standing there watching the light, you'd see the light move at one speed, but somebody else running uh, past you, or maybe flying past you in a spaceship, going very, very fast, relatively, you would think that that light would actually look like it's going slower, right? Just as if you're driving uh, two cars or driving parallel down a highway, right? One might be going 70 miles an hour, one might be going 60 miles an hour, but relative to the one going 60 miles an hour and the one going 70 miles an hour only looks like it's going about 10 miles an hour relative to this car, right? So due to the fact that their move, this frame of reference is moving, it seems like this one is moving uh, not as quickly as if you were at rest outside of both of those. So that's kind of the idea. It would seem that light should also move at different speeds depending on which reference frame you're in and how fast that reference frame is moving. Okay, so in order to test this, um, you need to have light essentially propagate um, either sort of in a reference frame that's not really, that's not moving in the direction that light propagates versus a reference frame that's moving very quickly in the direction that light is propagating. So what you can do is you can create this uh, um, experiment that uses an, what's called an interferometer and essentially an interferometer just takes a beam of light it splits it by putting essentially it hits a mirror that only reflects about half of it so half of it reflects one way the other half of it goes through those things come back and then they get that gets reflected this one goes through and so you essentially get the light combining back up together so you split the beam let it travel along some distance let it come back and then recombine it and uh, look at essentially the interference of those two beams now. The reason being, or the idea behind that, is that if those two beams have gone the same distance, or they've traveled at the same speed, and they go the same distance, then when they are recombining and come back together, they're still going to be in phase, meaning they're going to um, interfere with each other constructively, and you're just going to get a bright spot where they uh, hit a screen. Uh, and that would be opposed to if they go to those different, along those different uh, paths, 
and one moves, say, slower than the other, when they come back and recombine, one's gone, uh, one's sort of a little bit behind the other one, so it's actually out of phase with that one now, and now when they hit the screen, you might get destructive interference, and you just get a dark spot. So this is the idea behind this interferometer, and people thought, well, the Earth is moving very, very quickly uh, around the sun, so if we make an interferometer and have it at the equator, essentially, it doesn't really matter it's at the equator, but it's a good idea to uh, place to understand it, have it sort of at the equator and have sort of now one arm or one path for light to go that's in the direction that Earth is revolving around the sun. It's a sort of an east-west almost. Um, and then have the other path that's perpendicular to the direction that the Earth is revolving around the sun. Right? So a north-south kind of path. So thinking about that, the light that's going with the Earth is um, moving, you, if it's relative motion, then it's moving much faster, it's moving 67,000 miles per hour faster than the one that's going perpendicular to the Earth's motion. Because the Earth's motion is sort of adding to the one that's going in that direction, but it's not adding to the one that's perpendicular to it. Okay, okay. so you do that experiment, turns out, do as many times as you want, if it was true that light, uh, the speed of light was relative to what reference frame you're looking at it from, then you get sort of a dark spot, right? You get them going different speeds down the different paths and you get destructive interference, you get a dark spot. What are the results? Well, you always got a bright spot. They were always in, in phase. So, something else is going on, or not what they thought was going on. So that sort of brings us to another principle of special relativity, which has to do, or essentially says that the speed of light, at least speed of light in a vacuum, is constant. It's the same speed regardless of what inertial reference frame you're looking at it from. It doesn't matter the sort of the frame of reference that you observe light, you're going to measure it going the same speed. And that speed, remember, is about 300 million meters per second, uh, which translates to about 670 million miles per hour. So very, very fast. Um, and it's useful uh, to use a letter, a variable, not a variable, it's a, a letter, to designate the speed of light in a vacuum, and turns out we decided to use C for some reason. So C just stands for the speed of light, 300 million meters per second. And this principle technically we call the principle of the constancy of light, right? So the speed of light is constant in any of these reference frames. And the pictures here are kind of showing that, you know, whether you're standing still, you're in a frame of reference sort of at rest, and the source of the light, you know, like you have this big bright flashlight, if that flashlight was flying at you, even if it's flying very, 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 very fast, you're going to measure the speed of light coming at you to be 300 million meters per second. Or if that flashlight, the source of light, is flying away from you very, 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 very fast, even though you would think that maybe you would like pull away and light, you would see light coming at you slower. No, you still measure the light coming at you to be moving at 300 million meters per second. And finally, even if you're in a reference frame that's also moving relative to the reference frame of the light source, right? So like there's that light source, it's flying at you incredibly fast. You're on a rocket ship, you're flying at it incredibly fast, right? You're trying to measure that speed of light coming at you, still 300 million meters per second. So this is very different than uh, normal, uh, like comparing speeds in, in, uh, for normal things in different reference frames, right? Like um, when you are driving down the highway at 60 miles an hour, 
and you look across the median, somebody else is driving across the highway on the other side at 60 miles an hour. From your frame of reference, remember, in your own frame of reference, you're always at rest, right? so you appear to be at rest in your own reference frame. It looks like that car is actually moving 120 miles an hour in the other direction. right? Essentially, the, the relative motion of those two frames means that this car just looks like it's going much faster. This is not the case for light. Doesn't matter how fast you're moving, light will always be measured to be that same speed. And we say, I have to say in a vacuum, because technically this is the speed of light in a vacuum, and as we talked about in one of the past lectures, light actually propagates slower as it goes through mediums like air and water and glass. Um, the same idea holds though, if you're in a reference frame and you're moving very, very fast, you measure the speed of light somehow in glass, then you're going to measure the same speed if you were at rest and trying to measure the speed of light in glass. Right? So the speed of light is going to be constant regardless of which reference frame you're in, even though light might propagate at different speeds depending on what material it's propagating through. So light changing the speed it propagates uh, when it goes through like glass or diamond, right? that's a whole different aspect or different thing from this idea of you're observing light when you're at rest, you're observing light when you're moving relative to the source of that light, it doesn't matter, you're going to measure the same speed of light. Okay, so this fact that light propagates at the same speed, you measure light to propagate at the same speed, regardless of your reference frame, has some very interesting and strange um, sort of uh, outcomes, things that uh, have to be true because that is the case. Okay, and the first thing has to do with uh, clocks and time. So if you have a clock, right, generally you're measuring seconds by like how many ticks the clock does. So in a pendulum clock, like a grandfather clock, the pendulum goes back and it goes forth, and maybe it, you know if it's calibrated well, it's going to go back and forth. Click one second, right? one tick, one second, another second, right? So the swinging of the pendulum is what's telling you how many ticks uh, or how long a tick is for that clock. So back and forth, tick, forward, tick, right? So the swing, or technically we call this the oscillation of the pendulum, but don't worry about that. So that swinging is what's ticking away the seconds, essentially, or what's ticking away time. Now we want to imagine a, a light clock that instead of using a oscillating uh, pendulum, we use a light, like um, imagine any source of light you want, but essentially like a photon that's going to bounce back and forth between two mirrors. Right? So the photon is goes away from this mirror, hits the top, comes back, tick. That's one tick. Right? Goes up, comes back, tick. That's another tick. Right? So instead of this oscillation, this pendulum going back and forth, we actually are taking, using this photon going back and forth to measure the ticks of the clock. Right? So it's this that's ticking, uh, ticking time along, right? that up and down motion. Okay, so keep that in mind. This is our this is our clock now. It's bouncing, this photon bouncing back and forth. Right? Okay, so now we want to compare what two observers would see watching this light clock. One observer, observer A in this case, we're going to call it observer A, is going to be at rest uh, with respect to the light clock. Right? So essentially they're like holding the light clock, or they're in, in this picture, they're in a uh, spacecraft and the light clock is stationary, the space clock, in the, in the spacecraft. Right? That is going to be opposed to observer B, who's outside of that spaceship, and is watching the spaceship zoom along. Right? The spaceship's going to be flying along very, very quickly. Okay, so now we're going to move to, this is where your imagination comes in, you imagine yourself in the one reference frame, so first in the reference frame of the person who's stationary with respect to that light clock. So the, the person in uh, that diagram or the picture A here, right? They're sitting, they're watching the light, they're watching the photon go up and down, right? And you kind of have to imagine light moving a little bit 
you know, again, the, you can actually watch the light propagate. But it's going to move much, much faster than that, and you're not really going to be able to see it propagate. But, you know, if you're concerned about that, then maybe you say how many times it needs to go back and forth before one second goes away, and you're actually watching that instead. It doesn't really matter. So, for our purposes, we can just imagine that that photon, we can actually just watch that photon go up and go down. So the person in A watches the light go up and down. They want to see the, they can calculate the time for that tick. And the time that it's going to take to tick is going to be twice the distance, right? So the distance from the floor to the ceiling and then back again. So twice the distance from the floor to the ceiling divided by the speed of light, divided by how fast it's going. So you take that distance, divide it by the speed of light. There you go. That's one tick of the observer's, observer A's uh, version of this light clock. And for uh, the observer um, in the B reference frame, right, the one that's outside the spaceships, kind of at rest, the spaceship is moving along. Um, for them, the path of the light is not just straight up and down. Right? Because the whole spaceship is moving along, they see the photon travel up from the bottom mirror up to the top and this, along this diagonal path. Bounce off the top mirror, come back again diagonally down, hits the bottom mirror. That's one tick. And since it has to travel this diagonal path, that path is longer than the path that the first observer in A uh, or for, the, for that first observer. So the time for B's tick is going to be, well, it's longer than, we don't have to know exactly what it is, but it's longer than the distance from the floor to the ceiling and back, right? Because it's this diagonal sort of path here. And it, but you're still dividing that distance by the same speed, the speed of light, right? Because each of these observers, again, is going to observe light moving at the same speed. So that's why the denominator of each of these equations is still the speed of light, 300 million meters per second. So if the denominator is the same, the numerator is bigger, that means the tick that B observes is larger. Right? It's a longer, it takes a longer time for the clock to tick in B's reference frame. So the consequence of this is that the observer in B's reference frame actually sees clocks ticking slower in uh, that uh, in the moving reference frame. Right? Oh, I happen to have, have a little bit of a visualization of this, so let's check that out. So this one's kind of nice because it has that stationary light clock just bouncing up and down and it's showing the ticks along the um, top here. Versus the moving light clock, which has to follow this diagonal path but still move at the same speed. So you can see the amount of ticks on the moving light clock are less than the one on the stationary light clock. All right, well, what does that mean? That means that if the if you watch someone fly by you very, very fast, very, very quickly, then it's going to appear that their time is going slower. You're going to see their clocks tick slower than you'd see the clock, than your own clock tick. So as a consequence, and that is purely the consequence of the fact that light has to move in this, at the same speed regardless of which reference frame you're in. So that means the denominator of both of those equations is the same. So when the numerator gets bigger, the tick is bigger. So that implies, or tells you, that moving clocks are going to tick slower, essentially. That's a shorthand way of putting it. And again, this is with respect to the stationary clock, like the stationary reference frame. The moving clock is going to go seem to tick slower. And it's not just you know a light clock, right? The light clock is just a, a way of imagining time passing by, or a way of visualizing um, and interpreting time passing by. So it's actually, it's not just ticks that are going slower, it's time that's moving slower. And this uh, effect is what we call time dilation. Right? Dilation just means getting longer, so whenever you see a moving uh, 
clock, the time that it's going to appear to tick away is going to uh, go slower. It's going to be a longer amount of time, right? So time dilates as you move, as you have very fast moving reference frames. And the amount that time sort of slows down and the amount that, say, one tick elongates or dilates, um, it depends on how fast that other reference frame is moving, right? So the person in the spaceship, if they were going even faster, then the photon would need, would need to go even further to go through one tick. So the tick that the person that B sees is going to be even longer, right? So the faster and faster and faster those, uh, that moving reference frame is going, the slower and slower and slower it's going to seem like, or you're going to see their clocks ticking. As it turns out, and you know, I'll make a more of a point about this, um, I think, towards the end of the next lecture. But um, the effect of this, you know, I've been saying this happens, and it does happen, but we never really see that happening. And the reason being is, in order to see anything uh, like this, you need to either be moving incredibly fast, that reference frame needs to be, or that light clock needs to be moving, or any clock needs to be moving ridiculously fast, like half the speed of light, before you see any noticeable difference. Or you don't have to be moving that fast, but you have to have incredibly accurate measurements or ways to observe things on a very, very small time scale. And we don't generally do that. So this graph at the bottom here is essentially showing how much time dilates or how long, how much longer each tick of the clock gets as that reference frame moves faster and faster and faster. Right? And that blue line is essentially showing that any, all the way up to about half the speed of light one tick on the stationary clock is pretty much one tick on the moving clock. Right? So even if you're going 150 million meters per second, there's still not there's still not going to be a very large notice or noticeable on human scale difference between the two clocks. Right? It takes even all the way up to it looks like about 90 percent the speed of light for one tick on the stationary clock to uh, be equivalent or to see. Uh, as two ticks on the moving clock, right? So essentially that's saying if you have a reference frame and uh, that reference frame moves past you at 90% the speed of light, then one tick on your clock is going to be the same as two ticks on theirs. Um, and as you get closer and closer and closer to the speed of light, that factor, that amount that uh, um, the time dilates as the ticks get longer and longer, just goes up and up and up and up. Okay, so as I said, this effect is very small for the most part, unless you're moving incredibly fast or you have very, very accurate ways of measuring things. Right? You can measure down to uh, the trillionth of a second. And as it turns out, something we all rely on every day, pretty much every day, um, very often, is uh, a system that does actually have this incredibly high uh, accuracy in terms of the time. Okay. So GPS, or Global Positioning System, is a way that you can, uh, we use satellites to triangulate um, position, your position on the surface of the Earth. And we don't need to go into how they, that triangulation and all that works, but essentially those satellites rely on incredibly precise clocks on the satellites and uh, syncing those clocks up to clocks on Earth. Incredibly precise meaning these are something, they use something that we call atomic clocks, and it's basically just atomic clocks because it, it's counting away time by vibrations of an atom. And that happens very, very fast. So the, these clocks are accurate to within a trillionth of a second. So incredibly accurate uh, small scale that we're talking about here. So GPS satellites, right? Their satellites are moving along. And uh, it turns out that they move at about 4,000 meters per second. And again, it's relative to the surface of the Earth. And so clocks on the satellite are going to tick a little bit slower because they're moving at that fast rate. Right? Um, it, as it turns out, 
those clocks will lose about seven millionths of a second every 24 hours. Right? So because they're taking longer each tick, they're actually uh, losing a little bit of time relative to the clocks on the Earth. So every 24 hours, it's about seven millionths of a second off. Right? And for you and me, that means almost nothing, right? You're never gonna experience anything on like that scale of seven millionths of a second. But when you have clocks, and you rely on clocks that are accurate down to a trillionth of a second, that's well beyond that threshold, right? So as it turns out, we need relativity in order to understand, well, why that happens, and then also be able to correct for it, right? So relativity is in place, special relativity is in place uh, every day when you're using your GPS clocks because we calculate how much that uh, clock on the satellite is going to take slower, and we actually can um, account for that by calibrating them so that they stay synced up to clocks on the Earth's surface. And if you didn't have that, if you didn't do that, essentially the GPS positioning would just uh, slowly but continuously sort of drift away from the true positions on Earth. Okay, so another consequence of light moving at the same speed, regardless of your reference frame, uh, is what we would call simultaneity. So in everyday life, you sort of think generally, well, um, if one person sees something happen and I see something else happen too, or I see that thing happening too, we, it happened at the same time. If we see it happening, at, we each see it happening, then, or we each see it happening at the same time, it happened at the same time. Maybe that wasn't a great explanation. Never. <laughs> but the idea being that even though I see an event at one time and another person sees an event at another time, it, there's no uh, absolute sense that those events, those two things have actually happened at the same time. So let's just give an example, right? So again, we're gonna imagine ourselves as being in a spaceship, zooming across, or zooming across the surface of the Earth very, 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 very fast. And inside of that spaceship, there is a source of light and now instead of being that light clock where it's bouncing up and down, it essentially we're, it's giving off a flash of light, and for our purposes, it's probably best to imagine it gives off just a photon in each direction, right? So the uh, source of light just shoots a photon off in either direction, so, and the observer in A, right, is moving along with that source of light, and so it's gonna see the light propagate out um, uh, just you know, at, the, at the speed of light, towards the front and the back end of the space, spacecraft, the spaceship. And in observer A's frame of reference, the light's gonna hit, the photon that went towards the back is gonna hit the same time as the photon that hit, uh, went towards the front, right? They both hit. So the photon in the back, photon in the front is a simultaneous event. This event happened at the same time as this event for this observer, for observer A. All right, now, move yourself to observer B outside of the spaceship on the Earth's surface, so watching this spaceship go by very, 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 very quickly. From their perspective, light, those two photons both leave the source of light in the middle of the spacecraft, and since they, that observer outside also has to see light traveling at the same speed, Right? It can't go faster towards the front or towards the back. Right? They have to propagate away at the same speed. But in their B's frame of reference, right, the photons are moving, but the spaceship is still moving along. Right? So the photons propagate out at this constant rate. The spaceship comes along and essentially slams into the uh, back photon first. Right? The back of the uh, uh, spaceship essentially catches up with that uh, one photon and hits that one first and the one going towards the front takes a little bit longer and then finally hits the front. So there you go. These are events, photons hitting the front and the back of the spaceship, that are simultaneous. They happen at the same time in observer A's reference frame, but in observer B's reference frame, they are not simultaneous. The one hits the back of the uh, spaceship first and then the one hits the front of the spaceship. 
So as another consequence of light traveling at the same speed in both reference frames, we lose the idea that events that happen simultaneously in one person's reference frame are also simultaneous in another per person's reference frame. Okay, so I have another question here. Uh, suppose that the observer standing on a planet sees a pair of lightning bolts simultaneously striking the front and the rear ends of the compartment in a high-speed rocket ship. Will the lightning strikes be simultaneous to observer in the middle of the compartment of the rocket ship? So now you're imagining yourself, again, this is like observer A and observer B, except in this case, it's observer B who we're kind of starting out with and saying, all right, I looked up, it's observer B, I see lightning bolts strike both ends of this uh, spaceship. Okay. And then ask yourself, okay, are those, they're simultaneous in uh, that reference frame, are they simultaneous in a reference frame where you're inside of that spaceship? Hopefully, you said no, they are not simultaneous. So, since in observer 8B's reference frame, or the, the one that's outside the spaceship, you see these two lightning strikes hit the spaceship at the same time, right? But to see that, you essentially had the lightning hit there and then those photons hit your eye that, uh, from that strike, right? In the spaceship, if you're inside of the spaceship, the lightning hits the front and the back and photons give off, so they're going towards the center, towards the person inside of the uh, spaceship, right? But the spaceship's moving along very quickly, so essentially the observer in the spaceship is gonna catch up to the photon from the front before the one from the back can get to them. So in that case, the observer sees the lightning strike the front of the spacecraft first and then the back of the spacecraft. So again, other, another example of events that are simultaneous in one reference frame are not simultaneous in a different reference frame that's moving with respect to that first one. And I should also point out that all this that we're talking about, again, really, you have to imagine these are incredibly fast speeds we're talking about. This doesn't, you won't normally see this kind of behavior because we generally move at pretty slow speeds. Okay, and uh, yeah, we're just going to go through some more consequences of light moving at the same speed regardless of the reference frame that you're in. And in these next ones, I'm not going to go through quite as detailed of an explanation of like observing this and then seeing why it is like this. I'm going to kind of give it to you. And the first one being um, this idea or this uh, consequence of length contraction. It essentially, objects, the length of an object, or how long you would measure an object to be, because light travels at the same speed in all these reference frames, it turns out that length is not constant either. If I'm, at a, uh, if I'm in a reference frame that's at rest, say to like this uh, meter stick, okay, meter stick right here, I'm gonna see it and yeah, it's a meter. It looks like it's a meter stick. It's, oh, I'll measure it to be a meter. Right? However, if another meter stick were to fly along at about 90% the speed of light, right above uh, the one that I'm holding on to, sitting right here, that one flies along. Um, it's an exact copy of this meter stick, right? Two of the same meter sticks. This one's just moving very fast. I'm going to measure the length of that second meter stick to be about half full, uh, half a meter. So when objects move very, very quickly, we get this thing, we get this length contraction, meaning the object seems to be shorter, or it seems to be kind of compressed in the direction that the object's moving, right? So just because the meter stick is moving left to right here means that the length is gonna contract in that direction. It doesn't mean it's gonna switch down like this, right? It's only in the direction of the motion. And as another example, you could look at, say, like a baseball, round, spherical object, and uh, 
see how it uh, contracts, the length of it, or the width of it in this case, uh, contracts as it moves faster and faster and faster. Right? So initially, not moving at all, zero speed, then you have a nice round baseball. Um, if it moves very fast, right? and again, when to actually see the effects of this, or actually see anything noticeable, we're going to talk about incredibly fast speeds. So the next picture over is 87% the speed of light. So already millions, hundreds of millions of miles per second. Or sorry, hundreds of millions, hundreds of, millions of meters per second. Yeah. Um, and so at 87% the speed of light, it's contracted down. At 99.5% the speed of light, it's squished down even more. Uh, going all the way up to 99.9% of .9 speed of light, it's almost this like sliver, right? And so that length is contracting, it's contracting again in the direction of uh, motion here. So it's not squishing down this way because it's not moving in that direction. Okay, so another consequence of this constancy of the uh, speed of light is, okay, well take a Imagine another situation where, say, you're in a spaceship. That spaceship is traveling at half the speed of light. It's going very fast. And you fire a missile out of that spaceship, also at half the speed of light. How fast is that missile going to be traveling um, from uh, your perspective? Your perspective meaning you're outside of each of these things. You're watching the spaceship come by, and it fires out, it goes, zoom, fires out the missile. Um, how fast are you going to see it traveling? Well, Newtonian physics is would say you just simply add those two speeds together, right? It's the speed of the spaceship plus this extra speed that you're giving to the missile, half the speed of light plus half the speed of light is C, the speed of light, right? Turns out that's not true. That's not how things work when you go very, very fast. Um, you can't simply add velocities like that anymore. This factor, uh, again, uh, special relativity comes into play, and the addition of velocities just doesn't work that simply anymore. Um, it's the the way to actually work it out. It can be it looks a little tricky. The equation maybe so we're not going to look directly at that, but just to tell you that the result of this situation would be you'd actually see the missile traveling at four fifths the speed of light. It's so about 80% the speed of light. And also as a consequence of this, it turns out that nothing with mass can actually move uh, at the speed of light. You can't speed anything up um, that much to get it to go to the speed of light, to get it to go to that C. Um, the picture over there is just a spacecraft, imagining a spacecraft shooting a missile. But the other uh, picture here is this graph where um, essentially you're looking at the velocity uh, vertically and the amount of time. So essentially you have like this object and you're just going to start putting force on this object in order to speed it up, right? So you're putting a force on, you're causing acceleration, you're causing the speed, the velocity to increase. Right? And for Newtonian physics or Newtonian uh, motion, you would essentially, the more and more uh, force, or the longer and longer you put that force on, the longer and longer you're going to accelerate it, and essentially you're just going to keep increasing the speed linearly. It's going to just keep going up and up and up, and you cross the speed of light, and you just keep going faster. As it turns out, that's not the case, and what happens is essentially, the short, the short way to put it is that the faster and faster you get this object going, the harder and harder it becomes to get it to go any faster. So in the end, it turns out, if you theoretically wanted to get something to go the speed of light, you'd have to uh, push infinitely hard, essentially, and you can't do that. So the speed of your object is going to increase linearly up to certain speeds, up maybe you know when you get up to, I don't know, 10% speed of light or something like that, and then it's going to break away from that linear uh, growth, and you're only going to be able to speed it up less quickly, right? The acceleration is going to be less and you're going to be speeding it less, less, and less, and then it's just going to level off before you get to that speed of light. Uh, 
Okay. And so just a preview kind of of the next one, um, a couple more things in this lecture, but uh, a preview to next time is basically to say that all these observations, um, you know, time dilation, length contraction, uh, velocity addition, it's happening differently. All this stuff kind of points to the idea that space and time aren't really separate things. As you start moving very, very quickly, it turns out that space can contract, time can contract, uh, or time can elongate, dilate, sorry. So what's happening is really the, this is uh, pointing to this intimate connection between space and time. Right? They're not separate things. In fact, they're one and this part of the same thing, which we call space-time, one word. Um, so everything, planets, people, stars, galaxies, they exist in what a physicist calls the space-time continuum. It's kind of an abstract concept, but we're going to talk more about it next time. And so what that means is to really fully define where an object or the position of an object, you can't just say uh, where it is, you have to say when it was there. And. So, yeah, so just to say that space might be a three-dimensional thing, you have height, depth, uh, or height, length, and depth, whatever you want to say. There's three dimensions, so you can define uh, volume in, you can find space, but the universe is actually made up of a four-dimensional fabric that we call space-time. So it's all those three dimensions of space plus one dimension of time. So, more next time. Okay. So another consequence of uh, this constancy of light and the um, principle that the laws of physics have to be the same in all inertial reference frames is what's called the mass energy equivalence. It turns out that these principles will lead you to the consequence that mass and energy are actually kind of different versions of, uh, not different versions of the same thing, but they're equivalent in some way. So if you have a certain amount of mass, that is equivalent to saying I have this amount of energy. Or if you have a certain amount of energy, that can be equivalent to saying I have this amount of mass. And even when we've talked about energy a bit, and generally, well, I've told you about the main kinds of energies, that is kinetic energy, so the energy of things in motion, and potential energy being the energy of how things are arranged relative to each other. There's one other kind of energy now that we call rest energy. So this is, has nothing to do with uh, motion. Even if an object is completely at rest, just say hovering in outer space in the middle of nowhere, and there's nothing else around, so there's no kinetic, there's no potential energy, it still has energy as long as it has mass. Right? That mass is equivalent to a certain amount of energy. And that energy due to that mass is what we call the rest energy. Um, yeah. And that sort of idea is partially uh, sort of encapsulated in this equation, which you've probably seen. It's one of the most celebrated and well-known equations from the 20th century. It's E equals mc squared. So the energy that an object has, rest energy, and this is what the equation is about, the rest energy is equal to the mass of that object multiplied by the speed of light squared. So the fact that the speed of light, c, is 300 million meters per second, it's already a very big number. You square that, you get an incredibly large number. So that means that even a tiny amount of mass is equivalent to a very large amount of energy. So that fact that a tiny amount of mass can equate to a whole bunch of energy, an incredible amount of energy, is useful, um, well, if you can liberate that energy, if you can convert that mass into energy. Um, so before getting into that, you could just say that when you have a power plant and say that power plant is generating 90 million megajoules of energy, 
that's maybe, I don't know, I think that's roughly maybe the amount of energy that the power plant will put out in a year or something like that. Maybe. Something like that. But to say that is equivalent to saying that essentially it's converted one gram of mass into energy. Okay? One gram is this huge amount of energy right? because C is so large, because the speed of light is so large. Um, for things like, for, for our sun, our sun actually converts mass into energy. That's what's powering our sun, so right? So we talked about um, nuclear fission last time and fusion, but in nuclear fission, like I told you, these two uh, nuclei will come together and they're gonna combine, right? But it turns out that when they come together, the amount of mass of the two of them together is a little bit less than if you were to just add the mass of either of them apart. So where did that mass go? Right? It converted into energy. And it only takes a tiny amount of mass to make an enormous amount of energy. So it turns out, well, in the sun, I guess, in one second, the sun is converting four and a half million tons of mass into energy. Right? And that's equivalent to uh, something like a trillion, trillion joules of energy. Ridiculous amount of energy in every second. Right? But the sun is incredibly massive. There's a whole bunch of mass there. So even though it's converting all of this mass every second, um, it has a whole bunch of mass. So it's not going to go out anytime soon. And it can produce an enormous amount of energy from that mass. Yeah. So in a million years, only one tenth of a millionth of the sun's mass is going to convert to the, be converted to energy. Right? So the sun's going to keep burning for billions of years. Okay. So the last thing is uh, concerning ourselves with well, how does this new idea, this special relativity? mesh with the old ideas. Right? So in the same way when we're talking about uh, quantum mechanics, the, we need to adhere to this correspondence principle, meaning that you can imagine all these crazy things happening, this length contraction, this time dilation, and that's all great, but in the realm where uh, things aren't moving that fast, you should still be able to describe them with relativity, also describe them with our old cl classical physics because we know the old classical physics works in those ranges where they're not moving very fast and they need to overlap, they need to agree with each other, right? Where they do overlap, they need to agree. This is our correspondence principle. And essentially the reason that we're okay or that the special relativity does this and follows this principle is just like I've indicated, when it's only when you're moving at crazy fast speeds that you get any of these effects, right? Or when you're moving at fairly fast speeds, but you have incredibly precise uh, measurements of time, right? You can measure, you have very, very accurate measurements of time. So essentially the amount, if an object's gonna be moving along quickly, the amount that it's gonna contract is imperceptible unless it's already moving at like half the speed of light. Right? And nothing in our classical physics, nothing before um, the last hundred years or so, even really considered things moving that fast. Well, maybe not, that's not true. But never really concerned themselves that much with things moving that fast. Right? Because we couldn't observe it, we didn't have anything accurate enough to measure it, and so what does it matter? Right? So the classical physics, the cla all the stuff before that, does really well with things that aren't moving that fast. Right? It's once we get into this range where things start moving very, very fast and we can measure them accurately that special relativity becomes important. Right? And before that, who cares? You don't really need special relativity. If you're not going to be just driving down the highway, you don't need it. Well, except for the GPS stuff. Um, okay, and then the last thing I wanted to point out is uh, I sort of, I've shied away a lot from uh, using many mathematical expressions in this course because that's not really what this course is about, but um, I think it's maybe useful just to uh, point out 
this thing called the Lorentz factor. So the Lorentz factor, um, you use the symbol gamma, uh, this Greek symbol gamma to represent the Lorentz factor, and it's basically a number that tells you how important special relativity is going to be. Right? If that number is 1, it's not important at all. If that number is bigger than 1, it's going to start to be important. And the larger and larger that number is, the more and more important special relativity is going to be, the more you need to take it into account. Right? And so essentially for everyday things, for most of the things we deal with in our life, that factor is 1. So it doesn't really matter. Right? You need things to be going like half the speed of light or a very significant fraction of the speed of light in order for that to be any, anything noticeably more than one. And the reason that it is one, well, in this expression, in the denominator of that fraction, there's a one minus v squared over c squared. So v is the speed of that uh, object, right? So how fast this meter stick is flying along. C again is still the speed of light, so 300 billion meters per second, right? So if V is a meter per second, then V squared divided by C squared is basically zero, right? That is to say that when the speed of something is not even close to the speed of light, then that speed squared divided by the speed of light squared is essentially zero. And that's, so you end up just getting one minus zero, which is one, the square root of one is one, one divided by one is one, right? So at any sort of normal speeds, much less than the uh, speed of light, the Lorentz factor is one and we don't need to worry about special relativity. Yes. Okay, so that's it for special relativity. Um, next time we're gonna be talking about general relativity and space time and black holes and things like that, fun stuff. So, have a good night, uh, or day, or whatever. I don't know what, I think I usually say good night because it's usually night for me. But, I uh, hope you're doing well. See you later.